Hey, Chapel Street Church. I'm excited to talk to you about something called Rooted. Some of you already know about Rooted. It's been part of our church for a number of years now. Uh, several years ago, we were thinking and praying about, if you ask the average person who's part of Chapel Street, what's next in their spiritual journey? We had a thousand different answers. And we felt like we needed one clear next step. And that's what Rooted has become. It's a 10-week journey through the gospel and scripture built around experiences. That's what makes it unique. It's not just study and filling in the blank answers. It's built around experiences through 10 weeks in community. There's a serve experience, there's a prayer experience, and these things combined in community help change people's lives. I've talked to many of you who have been deeply impacted by Rooted. Uh, some of you who are mature believers might be thinking, well, this is I've already passed this. Not so. It's for you. If you're a brand new believer, it's for you. If you call Chapel Street your home and you're looking for the next step in your life with Christ in our community of faith, Rooted is exactly for you. We encourage you to take part in it. There's a new round of Rooted groups launching very soon. So I want to encourage you, if you call Chapel Street your home and you're feeling like God is moving you to take a next step in your faith in the new year, get involved in a Rooted group. Don't take my word for it. We want you to hear from those who've been part of it. I came into Rooted having just graduated from Wheaton College a few months before. And while I was at Wheaton, I was surrounded by great community. I was in a great place spiritually and relationally and was honestly thriving. And then I graduated and in a lot of ways, it felt like that community got taken away. So then I joined a sub 30 Rooted group, which was <laughs> one of the best choices I think I've ever made. Just getting to know a group of people who were the same age and stage as me and just being able to open the Bible together and talk about these foundations of our faith together was such a cool experience. There's the prayer service, there's serving, there's strongholds, there's um, where a week where you talk about giving and that's very important. You you bring God into every facet of your life. I think the biggest takeaway for me was I thought I was okay, just me. And I'd go to church on every Sunday and I pray and I do my devotions and and I felt like I was I was still okay. I was walking. But now knowing that there are other people that I'm that are holding me accountable, that I'm holding them accountable, that I can go to them and ask for prayer, that has has really increased I guess my desire to be more like Jesus. If you are even thinking about Rooted, I would encourage you to go for it. I know that there might be some unknowns about the people in your group or about the things you're gonna be studying. You don't need to come into it knowing all the answers. In fact, I think a lot of the conversations that you have will be more fruitful if you're able to be in that space of not knowing all the answers, because that's when you're able to have really rich conversations with other people as you wrestle through things. That's part of the beauty of this community that you're building. So if you're on the fence, go for it. It'll change your life in the best way. <laughs>who was the last person you saw in that video. And I've been through it three different times, but she makes me want to do it again. She's so energetic and excited about it. I want to encourage you, it's not too late to sign up uh, if you're interested in this uh, Rooted program. It really is a, a great next step in your spiritual journey. Whether you've been a part of the church and walking with Christ for a long time or you're brand new, Rooted has something for you. We encourage you to take part in that. Uh, this is January, as you know, and we're past the holidays, and so it's, it's the long, cold, dark of winter, and it can feel like there's nothing new, but we're in the, on the threshold of a brand new series, which I'm very excited about, uh, a series uh, called The Gospel in Genesis, looking at the, the big questions of life. Who are we? Where do we come from? What's our purpose? Who is God? How do we relate to him? What's wrong with the world? What is God's plan to set it right? All of those things, the foundation for the answers are laid in the first three chapters of the Bible. So for the next several weeks, we're going to be exploring Genesis 1 to 3. And I have the joy of introducing to you uh, for the second time uh, our, our guest, well, he's not so much a guest anymore, uh, but our, our preacher who's going to kick off this series, Dr. John Dixon, comes to us. He's preached to us once before. He'll be here a number of times in the future. Uh, he's uh, is a newly endowed chair in public Christianity at Wheaton College. He's become a dear friend to me and to our church family, and I'm excited that he gets to launch this series. Before he comes and does that, however, I've asked Jan Bowserman to come and read to us the Word of God. So let's stand together as we hear God's Word re read from Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 13. 
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate waters from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. And it was so. God called the expanse sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered in one place, and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called sea, and he saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, bearing, wait, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with seeds in it according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seeds according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seeds in them according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good, and it was evening, and it was morning, the third day. You can be seated. Hi, uh, again. Um, it, it's always encouraging, where, you know, as a speaker, to get a second invitation, you know, to be back second time. You know it didn't crash and burn the first time. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, brother. Uh, and, and this is a particular privilege uh, to be giving this message because I, it's the first sermon of the first sermon series of the new year, and it's from the first page of the Bible. Like, how good is that? Um, in fact, when Jeff asked me to give this sermon, I was like, are you sure, mate? That's, that's a purple passage, Genesis 1. That's like lead pastor's privilege. And he was super humble and generous. No, no, brother, I want you to, to do that. And I went away. And then I thought, hang on. Genesis 1 is also one of the most controversial passages in the whole Bible. <laughs> Has he just given it to the dispensable foreigner? Because if he messes it up, it doesn't really matter. Now I choose to believe the first interpretation. He's generous and uh, humble and just, you know, it is a privilege. And indeed, I do feel the privilege, even though the controversy is real and twofold. Uh, on the one hand, our sceptical friends listen to Genesis 1 read, and they say that's all that's wrong with religion. Anti-science fairy tales. Famous atheists have said Genesis 1 is the uh, childish imaginings of Stone Age goat herders. And you hear that often. <laughs> well, it's a problem. And for Christians, of course, the controversy is how are we meant to read this passage? Is it literal? Is it metaphorical? Is it young earth, six-day creation versus old earth and all of that? Now, I'm not going to solve all the problems. I'm sorry. But I do want to say a couple of things about these controversies before I get on to the good stuff. First thing I want to say is that when skeptics mock Genesis 1, they are often, and I don't mean to be impolite here, they are often projecting their own lack of knowledge of the Bible onto the Bible. They don't happen to know anything remarkable about Genesis 1, so there mustn't be anything remarkable in Genesis 1. 
It's a little bit like the 15-year-old in English class who's introduced to Shakespeare for the first time and finds it really difficult and gives it all of three minutes before he puts up his hand and says to the teacher, Miss, Shakespeare is stupid. And all of his buddies laugh, yeah, Shakespeare is stupid. But the joke's on him, isn't it? I don't mean to be impolite, but that's what a lot of grown-ups do with Genesis 1. And the fact is, I was that 15-year-old in English class, by the way. <laughs> I thought that about Shakespeare. And actually, I grew up thinking that about the Bible. But grown-up me is embarrassed that I ever thought that. And part of what I want to do today, when we get going, is I, I want to show how sophisticated Genesis 1 is. And I think I can make the case that anyone who reckons this scripture is stupid is saying really more about themselves than the scripture. And for Christians, embroiled in the controversy over young earth, old earth, literal, not literal, all I want to do is quote the advice of one of the most influential Christians in all of world history. I'm talking about Augustine of Hippo. Perhaps the most read of all the ancient Christian authors outside the Bible. Martin Luther said Augustine was the greatest mind of the early church. Uh, Calvin said the same thing. And he wrote about Genesis. And it's interesting that even in the 4th and 5th centuries, there was controversy amongst Christians about how to read it. It's not just a modern debate. And Augustine had what we might call conservative views of Genesis 1. But here's what he wrote about the bickering of Christians over this topic. Whatever Moses meant in these books, he meant it to be ordered by the two precepts of love. Love of God and love for neighbour. It is foolish rashly to affirm that Moses intended only one of these interpretations and then with destructive contention to violate love itself, on behalf of which Moses had said all the things we are endeavouring to explain. See, even in the ancient church, people would castigate each other over their readings of Genesis. And Augustine said, no, let's at least read this and learn to love God and one another. And I hope I can go some way to promoting uh, that, I think, beautiful approach to the Scriptures. All right, let me uh, leave the controversies aside and really get into the two things I want to do with you uh, today. The two points, nice and easy points. Uh, I want to give you three reasons uh, how Genesis 1 is a sophisticated text, okay? I'm going to give you three examples uh, of why the Shakespeare is stupid vibe doesn't really work. And then I want to give you uh, three examples of how Genesis 1 gives profound meaning to our lives right now. Sound like a plan? I know it sounds like a six-point sermon, but no, let's just go with the two, right? It's just two. It's just two. Firstly, then, how Genesis is a sophisticated text. The Bible, from Genesis 1 right through to the end, has captured the imagination and respect of some of the greatest literary figures of the modern world. I'm thinking of people like J.R.R. Tolkien, who openly declared his love for the narrative grandeur of the Bible from its opening page and felt that his own Lord of the Rings and Hobbit um, uh, stories and epics were in a sense an echo of that grand narrative. Or the Pulitzer Prize winning author that you should all be very proud of, this brilliant American author, Marilyn Robinson, my favourite novelist, has been described as the greatest living novelist. She wrote Lila um, and a bunch of others that, uh, uh, Gilead, that, that are just incredibly insightful into, into life. But she's also published a bunch of essays um, and some of the essays talk about how Genesis 1 to 3 really is the foundation of the Western world's vision of human flourishing. 
Literary greats stand in awe of this stuff. They don't say Shakespeare is stupid. All right, so let me then give you three examples of what I mean by the literary elegance and the sophistication of the Bible's uh, opening chapter. One, each creative scene all the way through Genesis 1 follows a lovely dance-like fourfold pattern. What you get is a simple command, the fulfilment of the command, an elaboration of the command, and then it closes with a day formula. There was evening, it was morning. I mean, the opening scene makes it clear, and this is the pattern that follows through. The command, God said, let there be light. The fulfilment, there was light. The elaboration, God saw the light was good. He separated light from darkness, called the light day, the darkness he called night. And then for the, the day formula, there was evening and there was morning the first day. And on it goes through the chapter in this lovely choreographed dance. I almost feel like dancing for you, but I won't. And there's a theological point in the choreography of this uh, chapter because it's making the theological point that the creation isn't accidental. It comes from the mind of an orderly artist. More about that in a moment. Second example of artistry. I know that looks like a crazy complicated screen, but it's worth knowing. Um, the ways that the days of the week uh, days one, two, and three, correspond to days four, five, and six like a canvas corresponds to a painting. Now, as soon as you see this and then you read Genesis, you go, wow, someone really smart produced this. So day one, light is created. And that corresponds to, if you think of this as two tablets, right? That corresponds to day four, where the actual lights of the sun and moon are put on the canvas, okay? And then day two, the vault of the sky and then the waters of the sea are created. But then on day five, on this canvas is painted the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. Canvas, painting. Day three, the land and the plants are created, corresponding to day six, where animals and humans walk on the land and eat the produce. Which then leaves day seven hanging as a day of rest to look back at the canvas and the painting and stand in awe of the artistry. That's what's going on there. Third example of the artistry of this chapter, why it is just dumb to say Shakespeare is stupid and Genesis 1 is stupid. There is number symbolism throughout the chapter that is deliberate. It can't have been accidental. The all-important number seven appears everywhere in the text. Now, if you know anything about the Bible or Hebrew history, uh, seven is the really important number because it depicts divinity, uh, perfection, wholeness. That's why the uh, menorah, the famous Jewish symbol of the seven candle lampstand, has seven, right? It's trying to depict this idea of, of perfection, of divinity. Now, seven is everywhere in Genesis 1. It's crazy when you see it. The opening sentence has seven words in Hebrew, right? And so, Immediately, uh, ancient readers go, ah, there's a seven coming, right? The expression, and it was so, the fulfilment formula, appears seven times in the chapter. Uh, the important expression, and it was good, seven times. The whole thing is structured around seven days or seven scenes. Then there are multiples of seven. This is where it gets even nerdier. The second sentence has 14 words. I believe that's two times seven. Then the word God, pretty important word, occurs 35 times. I'm pretty sure I remember my times table. That's five times seven. And then earth appears 21 times, which is three times seven. And uh, uh, heaven or sky appears 21 times, three times seven. Seven, 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 seven. Making the point that there is something whole, divine, a work of art. We mustn't be bullied by the skeptical world that looks at Genesis and says, this is the childish imaginings of Stone Age goat herders. Shakespeare is not stupid and nor is the scripture. Secondly, and more importantly, I want to give you three examples of why Genesis 1 gives meaning to all of life. 
And the first is perhaps the most uh, obvious and important thing Genesis 1 says. There is one orderly creator. There is one orderly creator. And that would have been the most obvious thing an ancient reader will have spotted when they opened Genesis 1. Maybe it's not the first thing we spot because we're just so used to, you know, if you're going to have any kind of God, you might as well just have one, right? Like that's just how we think. But in the ancient world, they didn't think like that. They thought many gods was the, the obvious way uh, to think about the universe. Now, there is a text written roughly the same time around Moses, 1200 to 1400 BC, by the Babylonians. And it's a creation story. It's called Enuma Elish. And the only reason I raise it is because it gives you an idea of how pagans, Babylonians, Greeks, etc., thought about creation. In Enuma Elish, no fewer than nine gods are named in the opening lines. Apsu did this, Tiamat did that, Kingju, Marduk, Ea, and so on. And they all get to do bits and pieces. Uh, with, with, the, with the creation. They go to war with each other. There's a massive war. And the, the sort of the wreckage of the war is what makes the creation. So the various gods, you know, fashion this bit into the stars, this bit into the rivers, and, and so on. Here's my point. Genesis 1 blows that idea away from the opening line. You imagine being a pagan... And opening Genesis 1 and reading the opening line, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That leaves nothing for anyone else to do. It's like the whole thing is over in seven words. (laughs) Seven words in the Hebrew. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is an incredibly solo affair and as the chapter rolls on there's loads of activity but just one person one actor there's speaking there's naming there's separating you know God says uh, God made God saw God separated God called but it's just one actor and what's more this God is the source of everything He is not a super being within the creation, like a pagan god, who merely um, fashions into different shapes and sizes the matter that was already there. See, in paganism, the gods never made anything. They just shaped things that were already there, and no one knows how they got there. But Genesis says, no way, God is the source of everything. Pagan gods were more like the Marvel universe, right? Super beings in the universe, They can do incredible things, but in no sense are they the source of the universe. They're like Thor or goblins or the fairies at the bottom of the garden. That's the gods of paganism. And Genesis comes along and isn't saying, our God's better than your God. No. It's saying our God isn't even a God in the sense you mean. Because our Lord is the source of all being. He is not a being. He is the source of all being and he lends being. He lends existence to every other being that has existence. And so we're left at the end of Genesis 1 in awe of the one orderly creator. Which leads us to the second piece of meaning that Genesis 1 offers us. Humanity is precious. Now I know you sit there and go, yeah, of course, everyone believes that. No, not everyone believed this in world history. I mean, Americans especially are so used to that brilliant line in your uh, Declaration of Independence that we think everyone always thought this. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men, and it meant women, are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. What a marvellous statement at the founding of your, your nation. But that is entirely based on the Bible's idea of human beings made in the image of God. Entirely based on that. 
Ancient Babylonians and Greeks and Romans would have thought that's nuts. No way is everyone equal. No way has God, uh, uh, the, the creator, endowed all humans equally with certain unalienable rights. See, in Enuma Elish, for example, um, the point is made that humans are the afterthought. You know, there's a great big war of the gods and out of the wreckage of the gods, um, the creation is made, as I said, and the losing gods had to then serve the king god, Marduk. And they had to bring Marduk food every day. And then one day, the gods start to complain that they are slaves, but they're meant to be gods. And they complain to Marduk, and here's Marduk's solution. Human beings. Tablet six of an Emulet. When Marduk heard the complaints of the gods, the losers, he said, I will establish a savage. Man shall be his name. He shall be charged with the service of the gods to bring them food each day, that they might be at ease. And out of Kinju's blood, Kinju is the losing god, they fashioned mankind. And Marduk imposed the service on mankind and let free the gods. When you heard this story, as every Babylonian did every New Year's Day, read out in public, you knew where you were in the pecking order of creation, didn't you? Right down the bottom. That you were basically made as a slave for the gods. The contrast with Genesis 1 could not be greater. Genesis 1 verse 26 says that every human being is made in the image of God. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds, the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Now, the build up to this important statement is really important to notice. It may seem a little bit nerdy, but I think there's value in it. And the author clearly wanted you to spot this. This line breaks the pattern that I mentioned before. Remember I said there's a beautiful choreographed dance through the whole creation. There's a command, the fulfillment of the command, an elaboration of the command, the day formula. A command, the fulfillment of the command, elaboration of the command, the day formula, okay? But suddenly when you get to the creation of human beings, that doesn't happen. Because what would you expect for the creation of human beings? Wouldn't you expect, just as there was let there be light, or let there be dry ground, or let there be the vegetables, let there be all the different things. No, you don't get let there be mankind, do you? No command. Instead, God talks to himself. At this high point in the narrative, the rhythm breaks down. It's like a key change in music to draw our attention to what's going on. God talks to himself. Let us make mankind in our image. The point, of course, is that this is the climax. In Enuma Elish, human beings were the last thing created because they were the afterthought. In Genesis, they're the last thing created because they're the climax. In Enuma Elish, human beings are made to be slaves. In Genesis 1, they are made to rule. In Enuma Elish, humans are fashioned out of the blood of the losing God, Kinju. In Genesis 1, humans are made in the image of the one true God. You matter. Regardless of your capacities, your usefulness, your performance, you matter to God, the Creator.
And a straight line can be drawn from Genesis 1 right through to the Gospels where we learn that you matter so much that God entered into the world in the person of Jesus Christ, lived the life we could never actually live and give that life on a cross for our salvation. You matter to God. He loves you. This would be unthinkable outside of the Bible logic. God served you. One last thing. And this last thing fills all of life with meaning. Creation is good. Isn't that a wonderful picture of the globe? I know you've never seen that before. That's how globes should look. (laughs) Uh, I'm being naughty. One of the most obvious things Genesis 1 says, um, after the most obvious thing, that there's just one God, one actor, the next most obvious thing Genesis 1 says is that creation is good. And you know how Genesis 1 gets this point across? It says it over and over and over and over and over and over. Was that seven? Look at this. Verse four, God saw that the light was good. Verse 10, the land and the sea is made. God saw that it was good. Verse 12, the plants and the trees. God saw that it was good. Verse 18, the sun and the moon. God saw that it was good. We're getting it. We get the point. Okay, okay. No, no, no. Verse 21, the fish and the birds. God saw that it was good. Verse 25, the animal kingdom. God saw that it was good. Six times you get this, it's good, it's good, it's good. And then if you missed that, you're at the bottom of the class, but just to help you along, verse 31 says, God saw all that he made and it was very good. Seven times. God created a good creation. Now, Enuma Elish that I mentioned before describes the fashioning of the world as the haphazard result of a war of the gods. Nature is wreckage. And, And actually, I could show you that virtually all ancient cultures saw creation this same way from ancient India right through to the earliest evidence we have of Celtic paganism. But the Bible says, no, creation is the good gift of a good God. And in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, no doubt reflecting on Genesis 1, says that it's still good. For everything God created is good. He's clearly reflecting on Genesis chapter 1. And nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God. I think he means by Genesis 1. That consecrates all creation. And prayer. And I reckon this perspective challenges not just ancient paganism, but modern atheism. Because even the Babylonians didn't go as far as the most famous atheist in the world today in describing the universe as accidental and meaningless. Here is Richard Dawkins, the great Oxford professor, the most widely read atheist still in the world today. He says this about the universe. The universe we observed has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at the bottom no design, no purpose, No evil and no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Imagine living like you believe that. Now I happen to know Richard Dawkins, though believes it, doesn't live like he believes it. He actually lives like there is good and evil, like there's purpose, like there's design. He has to live contrary to his actual conviction about the accidental nature of the universe. There is a very real sense in which atheistic naturalism 
has to deny what it thinks is reality in order to get on with life. And I think the cognitive dissonance of that is troubling. But our scripture says, no way. Creation is good. God saw all that he had made and it is good. Creation comes from the hand of a good God and is therefore brimming with the significance of a gift of love. Imagine living in the world like you believe that. That your neighbor is a gift of love. That the snow is a gift of love. Let me try and illustrate this. On my bookshelf, <clears throat> Jeff has brought this prop for me. On my bookshelf is this. It's been on my bookshelf for 20, 30 years. And now it sits in my Wheaton office. It's a hand-carved wooden three wise monkeys, right? Who see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. Now, I reckon on a good day, I could walk into the resale store down Front Street at Wheaton and uh, get them to take it and resell it for, <clears throat> I'm going to say 20 bucks, maybe 10. Jeff offered me 30 last night. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what I get. I mean, it's culturally significant. It is handmade and it's, it's good wood. But the thing is, this was actually a gift to me from my father. Years and years and years and years ago. Uh, from one of his many trips to India. And this, in fact, came um, just a short while before he died in India on one of those business trips. So you imagine how valuable this is to me. I'm not selling it for $10 or $20 or even $30, thank you very much. Why? Because this is more than the matter. It's not less than. I still appreciate the simple matter of it, but this is charged, supercharged, with the meaning of a gift of love. And my point, friends, is that Genesis invites us to see all of life as a gift of love. The body, the snow, the beach, each other as gifts of love, more than matter and form, charged with the significance of gift of love. Genesis 1 is more than sophisticated literature. It is life-changing. See, when you come to know the one orderly creator, the source of all things, the one who holds every particle in existence in every moment, and when you know that that one Lord thinks you matter so much that he entered the world to give himself for you, to serve you. And when in response to that, you live in this world, this material world, as brimming with the meaning of gifts of love, can you see that that would change everything? That is in part the gospel in Genesis. May the Lord write his word on our hearts this morning. So Father, please, wherever we happen to find ourselves in the journey toward you or even away from you for some, will you please speak to us? Will you please graciously give us insight, not just into the beauty of the text, but into the meaning that you grant us in creation and in Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.